All right. We're here today with Lana Bastasic. Did I get that right? Yeah, <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I guess it's 2 p.m. there, right? <laughs> it's, it's 2 p.m. where I am on the East Coast of the U.S. and you yeah. are in? I'm in Belgrade, Serbia, and it's 9 p.m. here. So, 9 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I've, I've, the book is Catch the Rabbit, which I've really enjoyed. And I'm you know, psyched to talk to you about it. Sure. My first question is, is Bosnia really that dark all the time? <laughs> uh, no, it isn't. Uh, it's not the first time I get this question. Um, oh. But yeah, it's one of the things that I wanted to do in the novel to make it more fictional and uh, fantastical in a way and show that it's just a book and it's just a story um, instead of just a list of Wikipedia facts. So uh, I wanted to show this kind of country that's more of this inside you know, mix of emotions and memories and, and how, how we feel when we think about our homeland um, more than just, you know, describe actual real Bosnia. I wanted to show it as, you know, what it is for my narrator and what it feels like for her to go back there. So it's more of an emotional landscape, uh, to put it that way, than you know, there's, I mean, it's, it's still, there's still daylight at 3 p.m. in Bosnia. So I want to encourage everyone to go, <laughs> to go there and visit and see, see for themselves. Yeah. I mean, I assumed it was, you know, a fictional device, but then again, you know, you could describe London that way. Like, yeah. You know, it's barely <laughs> ever sunny there. Yeah, and definitely. I assume this has to do with going down the rabbit hole as well, the darkness that you would. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I, I structured the book so that every chapter kind of mirrors the same chapter in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And of course, the first chapter in Alice, as most of you know, um, deals with Alice falling down the rabbit hole. So I wanted my narrator also to kind of fall down this rabbit hole, which is this moment when she hears her native tongue after a lot of years passed. And, um, and then kind of things unravel from there. Uh, so it was always supposed to be dark um, and not just dark as in you're not able to see something, but also this kind of social and political darkness where people kind of citizens willingly refuse to see things and talk about them and put them out in the open. I think that's still the situation in Bosnia in many ways. Um, so I just found this, you know, I wanted my narrator to fall down this rabbit hole through language and just kind of be dragged back into a, this mess that she'd left behind. Was Alice in Wonderland a big book for you growing up? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, there were a lot of books with female protagonists, you know, little girls going on a big adventure. Uh, it was mostly little boys. And um, also I devoured those as well. But um, this one kind of stood out because it is quite dark and scary. Uh, Wonderland is not exactly, you know, this just just all fun and games. It's I mean, people lose their heads there. Um, and um, so it, it really uh, meant a lot to me. But on the other hand, also because growing up as a little girl in Bosnia, um, there were many things that just seemed nonsensical, like uh, even to a kid, you know, sometimes a kid could actually see it better than the adults. So, uh, so I could really relate to Alice in many ways. And the title Catch the Rabbit obviously refers to that. Is it a literal translation of the original title? Well, yeah, uh, it is. Although the word that I used and the word that we use for rabbits, um, which is it, we use it both for rabbits and wild hares. Um, and so there is this kind of identity crisis in my language for, for rabbits and hares. And I like this because uh, naming is a, a big theme in the book and um, just wanted to show. And the journey that they take kind of takes them from a bunny to a painted wild hare. So there are many elements uh, I could connect and not just Alice, but also uh, actual rabbits and bunnies and hares in the book. Yeah. You translated it yourself. Um, what was that experience like? Yeah, that was, uh, I always say I wouldn't recommend it to anyone 
if you don't have to do it, unfortunately for many Bosnian women and also women writers in the Balkans in general, uh, it's very hard to get out there and, and you know, get your work read elsewhere and, and get an agent, etc. So I just figured I have to do this by myself because if I just sit around waiting, it's not going to happen. Uh, there are so many firewalls I would have to go through to get there. So I was thinking, OK, I want to get an agent. I'm in Barcelona. Nobody here can read in my native tongue, not read, not even say hello. So like if I want to if I want to get an agent and maybe make it out there, you know, just to get my book out there, uh, I need some sort of functional translation. So while I was doing it, um, it had never crossed my mind that that text, that translation would be published. Uh, I always thought there's like a proper way of doing that, which is you find an actual translator, he or she does the work, and then maybe you get published. But in the end, um, uh, very nice people from Picador UK, they liked this, the style, they liked the voice, they wanted to preserve that. So I ended up being my own translator, which was not my plan. <laughs> yeah. Were there any words that were just so much better in your native tongue than in English that you sort of struggled with? Well, that's hard to say, really, because I mean, I could also, you know, vice versa. There's some things that are to me sound better in English and there's some that sound better in, in Serbo Croatian or Bosnian. But um, I think it, it wasn't so much words. It's sometimes it would be like the structure of the sentence, because uh, my language is kind of much more plastic. You, you can play around, we use cases, so you can turn the sentence around, start with whichever part of speech you want. Uh, and English is much more rigid. It has a very rigid sentence structure. So uh, so I had to kind of uh, tone it down in a way. Um, but uh, all in all, um, I, I wasn't trying to be 100% accurate because I think that's not what a translation should do. I was trying to find that voice in another language. So I was trying to think what would Sarah sound like in English? What would be her English equivalent? And that's basically how, how I did it. Okay. I'm surprised to hear you say that things would sound better in English. I just assume that everyone, everything sounds better in a foreign tongue, like English. So, you know, model, yeah, maybe, model. but you know, I have, I have this uh, narrator who spent 12 years uh, in Dublin uh, and she kind of uh, created this whole new persona in, in English. So sometimes it even made sense that she would be thinking some things in English. And hmm. so that was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about choosing, putting her in Dublin. Is that a um, Joyce reference? It is. It is a Joyce reference. It is also a reference to myself because I kind of spent more than a decade uh, studying Joyce and his work, and I was teaching um, uh, Joyce and Ulysses um, in a language school in Barcelona. In a sorry, literature school in Barcelona, um, and I kind of felt that me escaping to Joyce and studies. Uh, was kind of, a kind of escape from you know my country and my language and everything that happened there so I thought that I would actually make that literal in the book so that Sarah would physically be in Dublin in another language um, so it was definitely that but also the fact that a lot of Bosnians young Bosnians um, did go to Dublin um, for work and other reasons um, I don't know why exactly there but somehow uh it was one of these uh, maybe easier options to uh, to just leave and find work elsewhere. Yeah. So you've taught Ulysses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Do you yeah, have a... and it was uh, it was you know voluntary. <laughs> Nobody made me do it. It was a punishment. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Like I I read that in two thousand eight. It was my summer reading. It was like. I, one of the books that I always knew I, I would, I had to read, you know, being a big fan of literature. And that summer, I was just like, all right, I'm going to do it. And like, I look back on it as being so difficult. But when I check my journals from the time, I absolutely loved it. Like, I loved everything about it. And I was like, wow, it, you know, it was obviously a difficult experience, but it was you know, totally worth it, which like, as the years went on, I kind of doubted a bit. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think people tend to overlook that that you know side of Ulysses which is it's really fun once you get into it uh but you have to get into it kind of obsessively yeah. uh, like either you go inside you know all in 
or you just maybe it's just not for you and that's fine i mean I, not everybody has to read it and like it but you know if you have this kind of obsessive mind if you go on a quest in a way uh i think it's worth it definitely so uh yeah i, I think maybe it's the academia and scholars scholars and everyone who maybe have done more harm turning it into this kind of monument of literature so people are scared of it without ever having opened the book but I think uh, everybody listening should give it a shot and, and I'm sure there's something fun for for them there as well do you have a favorite section uh, it, it changes over the years, you know, for a long time in the beginning, it was the last one, it was, the, you know, Molly's monologue, but then um, after a while, I got really attached to, to uh, chapter three, where Stephen is walking Brothers. down the beach, and yeah, <laughs> Stephen walking down Sandy Mount uh, Strand and, and kind of just, um, you know, thinking about things, and it's one of these big obstacle chapters where people usually give up on Ulysses, but um, at the same time, when you get get into it and into Stephen's mind you realize how beautiful it is so uh i would say now uh that's that's my favorite today today all right <laughs> <laughs> have you read finnegan's wake uh well you know i I don't think you can read Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of dive into it and, and out of it. And uh, uh, I recently met Fritz Zen, the director of James Joyce Foundation Zurich, who is probably the only man who can say that he did read Finnegan's Wake several times. And he himself said, like, I gave up on Finnegan a long time ago. It's just, you know, I can spend some time with a passage, but, you know, it's, I don't enjoy it as much as Ulysses. And I have to say, I agree, but at the same time, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I mean, you can just open it anywhere and see what, you know, where it takes you. Yeah. Um, I've, I've read all of Anthony Burgess's uh, writings on Joyce, which, I mean, it sounds amazing. And then you open it and it's like, oh, wow, this is formidable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. But you were in Zurich. Have you been to Joyce's grave? Of course, uh, I was in Zurich for uh, six months of writer, writer's residency. And um, and the first thing I did, I actually arrived in February and Joyce's birthday is February the 2nd. So I went there on his, and also Ulysses' birthday. Uh, and I, I bought some flowers, which in Switzerland are extremely expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Zurich is the second most expensive city in Europe, but still I bought some flowers and, um, and I, I, you know, I, visited the grave and also some other uh sites uh, that have to do you know joyce with his life and work um the meeting of the rivers you know, the two rivers meet which is very influential for finnegan's wake so yeah I, I got to you know do my joyce fan tour in zurich excellent yeah it's one of my favorite places in the world i i just i ended up in zurich in 1998 and i knew it was there and i was like i i gotta go and i took you know the tram line up and it was just like the most peaceful feeling I think I've ever had. I was there at like around sunset and I just sat and watched the sun go down over the mountains, you know, in front of the statue. And it yeah, was just it's like, beautiful. And did you know that the zoo is right next door? <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really close by. And Nora Joyce, um, uh, Joyce's wife said, it's really nice. I think he would have loved this just being here next to, you know, uh, what did she say? Hearing, hearing the lions roar uh, for eternity. <laughs> but uh, I, I tried it and you cannot really hear the lions. Uh, but yeah, the zoo is right, right next to it. So how did you end up studying English literature? What was that um, well, I mean, I uh, I did my a bachelor's degree in English language and literature. Um, it just seemed like a great choice. Um, I I did my undergraduate studies in Bosnia in Banja Luka, which is featured uh, in the novel. Um, and I always loved reading, and I just felt like this is a such a great program because you know you get to read a lot, but you also study syntax and language and. and it, you know, you get to learn another language and very professional level. Uh, so it kind of made sense. And it wasn't until much later that I got into Joyce. And it was because 
um, one of my literary professors, uh, I always tell, tell the story, but I mean, nobody really knows me, I guess, so I can- I, I'll I can stop you if I've heard it before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm not that famous. <laughs> nobody knows my stories. No, but uh, there was this professor who just, he entered the classroom one day and he said, okay, we're supposed to be Joyce today. We're gonna talk about portrait of the artist as a young man, but I haven't read Ulysses. I'm not gonna read that book and you shouldn't either. And for me, it was like this, you know, moment of oh, what's the deal with this book? You know, why would a, a literary professor brag about not reading it? Like, you know, it didn't really make sense. I got got into it on my own. And then it was kind of this hobby of mine, just, you know, going through Ulysses. Of course, the first time I opened it, I didn't get anything. And I was like, okay, I have to go. I have to read Aristotle. I have to read Dante. I have to read, you know, uh, Vico's theory of you know whatever <laughs> so it uh, it started there and um and I mean you never really stop you always keep even now when I open the book I find something new and to me that's remarkable mm. I'm happy that this podcast is turning out to be more about Joyce because <laughs> I feel I just feel <laughs> you know better equipped to talk about that I am gonna ask you about your book, book. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm, honestly, I'm a bit tired talking about it, so this is perfect. <laughs> I, guess, I guess, yeah, it's been out for, what, three years now? So. Yeah, in the original. Uh, and you know that what happens is you get translated, and I mean, you're happy that that's happening. But for you, the book is something that was done years ago, and now it's just starting its journey in another language. So you have to tell the whole story again and again. Uh, and I mean, I enjoy it, but at the same time, I feel like a broken record. <laughs> So I assume you're well into book number two. Is that the plan? Yes. <laughs> well, um, I, I published a short story collection and after, after the novel. Um, and that was something that I really wanted to do because I love short stories. I really enjoy working in them. It just makes me feel like a proper writer. Like I'm actually you know, working on each story, trying to make it all work together as a, as a collection, et cetera. And it was also a great bridge between two novels because I felt like I needed to, you know, clean my palate in a way, you know, get out, get Sarah's voice out of my head. I didn't want to write the same book all over again, the same voice, etc. So, so short stories were a great way of going back to, you know, my desk, working, writing, and kind of, yeah, cleaning the palate. Do you know Alejandro Jodorowsky? the filmmaker. Yes. He yeah. once said that uh, it's much easier to write in a thousand page novel than it is to write a short story. Do you <laughs> agree with that? Yeah, I, I think it's it's become sort of a commonplace for writers to say this. And I mean, I would agree up to a point. I mean, it's definitely, you can really tell when a short story is not working. You know, it's like everything has to be in its place, etc. You know, everything has to be kind of uh, packed really tight together and really well um, and if one element is not working like the whole structure you know just crumbles uh, whereas in a novel you need to have some you know some passages are better than others some serve as little bridges you know some serve as you know, just for the reader to get some you know air <laughs> before it can be etc uh, but at the same time I mean sit down and write it 1000 page novel you know it's it's also I mean it's a completely different kind of thing and both I think have their ups and downs but uh right now I'm really struggling with my, with my second novel so I wouldn't be so you know like yeah novels that's so easy I don't know <laughs> and you never really learn I mean you can never say okay I've done it once so now I know the drill it never happens I mean maybe for somebody else out there, but at least for me, it's like, oh my God, I feel like I'm starting all over again. Like I know nothing, you know, Ooh. it's a different book. <laughs> and so it's, it's real what they say about, you know, second novel angst, <laughs> like it's real. Oh boy. <laughs> How far are you into it? Well, it's, uh, I'm like halfway through my first draft, uh, but um, I'm just going slowly, but you know, I don't want to rush it. I don't want I don't want to let the market tell me <laughs> how fast I should go or what I should write. So I really want to do it well. So maybe I'm just perfectionist. I don't know, but it's going slowly. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, Catch the Rabbit is partly a road novel. Um, are you a fan of that genre? Totally. I mean, I love road novels. I love road movies. Uh, and another thing that I've noticed is that there are a lot of road novels uh, written by women or about women because, I mean, it, it, it is such a masculine genre. You know, it's movement mostly through, throughout history women were supposed to stay in one place. Um, you don't really go on an adventure. So this for me was exciting to try to do it from my perspective with two women. Um, and also it kind of gave me, you know, the, the scope, the, the um, territory that I wanted to cover where each place has some sort of symbolism in the history of former Yugoslavia um, and, you know, the civil war. So. It, it kind of just made sense to use to use that form. And then I would have kind of a spatial dimension, which is this journey. And I would have the temporal dimension, which is, you know, flashbacks and, and memories. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I mean, one book that really influenced this novel um, was Lolita uh, by Vladimir Nabokov. And um, that is a great road novel. People usually forget it, but I mean, it is this, you know, great road trip. Um, and also, in, not just in terms of that, but it also influenced me in terms of having this overbearing narrator and this other person that he is looking at and is describing. So, uh, so yeah, I again turned uh, to English and American literature <laughs> for help. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point about the narrator. Um, because, I mean, the short description is that this is a book about female friendship, but it's a lot more complicated than that in the fact that it doesn't seem like if they if they met now, I mean, they haven't seen each other in 12, spoken in 12 years. If they met now, it's highly unlikely they'd be friends. It's just that they have this childhood tie. And I mean, I got the sense that Layla was just very a very difficult person. And then you got to remember that you're seeing her through Sarah's eyes. She's had this completely different life, which... Uh, the war affected her a lot more. Um, so it makes sense that um, she seems difficult to, to Sarah and, uh, and to me, but. Um... Yeah, for me, I mean, this was the, the crucial question for me because when you are writing in the first person, everything kind of goes through that filter. Uh, so, you know, there's no omniscience, there's no um, actual facts, everything goes through memories and emotions of that one narrator. Um, and in this case, since I was working with Humbert Humbert and kind of had him um, in mind while creating this person, um, I wanted her to lure the reader in uh, with her language and metaphors and descriptions, etc. And then slowly kind of show that she's not to be trusted completely um and you know by the end of the book once the reader has all the flashbacks and everything that happened he or she would think okay there's this other person and there's this whole other story that i i don't really know because i haven't heard from this other woman um so this was this was really important and i mean there are a lot of people they're like I think the audience is kind of divided because there are people who tell me I hate Layla, I can't stand her, she's obnoxious, she's just, you know, it's so hard to deal with, she's like a little spoiled brat. But then there are other people who tell me, oh, Sarah is so annoying, you know, she's always like moralizing and explaining things. And this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted this, you know, dichotomy um, in the in the book. What I would argue is that if you just think uh, about the kind of life. Uh, they had um, and how different their childhood was and, um, you know, different things, different privileges that Sierra had and Layla didn't. Um, if you just think about that, I mean, it makes sense that Layla is not going to be this nice, dreamy, you know, character that you can just easily stomach. Um, mm -hmm. because she does in a way stand for Bosnia and uh, what that country has been through. Uh, so it's not always going to be pleasant. You know, she's going to bite because she's been bitten a lot, a lot of times in her life. Um, whereas Sarah had the privilege of just, you know, going through her childhood with no problems because she had the right name, the right, you know, ethnicity, moving away, 
turning into a whole other person. So, you know, it's, of course, they're going to be, they're going to be much different. And um, one is going to be more uh, palatable than the other. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't say I disliked Layla, but I, I just thought the whole atmosphere you're describing is not one of a pleasant car journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not even sure myself whether I would call it friendship or something else. You know, whenever I hear, you know, female friendship, and then I think of my friends, women are friends, I think like, it's nothing like that. You know, it's, it's this, I wanted something much darker, also something like this relationship that's very organic. It's like something that, you know, starts when they're so little that their own identities haven't really formed yet. So you can't really tell, you know, where one ends and the other one begins and which things come from, you know, which side. Um, and then, you know, there's also this love and hate and competition and all of these things. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly friendship, but I feel like we lack um, words to describe these kind of relationships between mm -hmm. people that are not romantic or, you know, family. I had a question about when Layla, when she, when they change her name and drop the J, is it still pronounced Layla? So basically, um, her mother changes her children's um, names and surname um, into a, a Serbian equivalent of the name, so the Christian equivalent. Mm -hmm. So Layla becomes Layla. It's like iron flat in a way. Um, and I know it sounds ridiculous and it is ridiculous, but actually Layla is a Muslim name and Layla would be a Serbian Christian name. Mm. So suddenly just by dropping that one letter, she would be safe or safer um, in that environment in the nineties. Right. I was just wondering if there was a uh, pronunciation difference. It yeah, there is a, there a little, is, yeah. but it's very <laughs> yeah. subtle to like, I probably couldn't. It, it's it it's very here. subtle, and it's I mean it's it just makes it even sadder that that difference with you know means so much. Yeah. Um, anywhere in the world, so uh, so I was happy I found this. Um, these two names actually exist. I didn't invent any name to you know, make it fit, um, but at the same time, it's just because this was happening. Um, I remember growing up, I remember children having their names changed overnight. Um, but here, you know, the change is so subtle and yet it could be the difference, you know, mean the difference between life and death. Yeah, I remember a um, friend of mine years back, I went, uh, when the trouble started, her parents put her on a plane to some relatives in the US. And she, whenever she talks about it, she's like, and suddenly it just mattered, you know, what your name was. Which, exactly and wow. this is you know this to me was another connection with alice in wonderland because what happens to alice is that everybody in wonderland keeps asking her who are you who are you <laughs> you know where did you come from what are you etc and you know when you're a child this question is just it doesn't really make sense i don't think it ever makes sense but especially when you're a child when you haven't even had the time to figure things out uh, on your own, you know, people just keep asking, what's your name and who are you? And suddenly it's important. Suddenly you start seeing your classmates in a, in a whole different light, you know? It's not like, oh, that's the girl I like and that's the boy I like. And suddenly it's like, oh, this is a Muslim and this is a Catholic and this is an Orthodox. So like, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is exactly what was going on. Now, you're a little bit younger than the two women in the book. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm, uh, I, I deliberately chose, um, I wanted Sarah uh, to be born on the exact date that um, Tito died. That Tito died. Yeah. Uh, so it had to be 1980. And it also meant that she would be a bit older when the war happened. So she would remember it better. Because mm. um, I was born in 86. Uh, so, I mean, my memories, I, I, I remember things, but I still didn't, you know, develop such friendships by that age or, you know, I didn't have so many things going on. Um, so this kind of made, made more sense. And also this, this date was kind of uh, significant. Yeah. Uh, one thing that really struck me was um, the bit after Armin disappears and they talk about the boys that go missing and then the body of one of the young men washes up in the river and that just, just it's so bleak 
and you know you were, it happens i know it, oh man yeah i mean <laughs> you know there are a lot of people who tell me oh it's it's a dark book or it's a sad book or you know i i, I don't like the ending etc and then i would tell them like i'm sorry but that's what bosnia was like um in the 90s and in many ways still is and i just felt like i would be betraying the story of my country if i just gave it a nice hollywood ending and you know happy things happening etc i didn't want to offer this kind of cheap catharsis to the reader yeah. it's just um i really wanted people to go through some of the feelings um that actual families went through when they're loved ones went missing or you know one that's dead somewhere um so i know it's it's bleak but um but i just yeah i mean you did that really well like it really had an effect on me reading it so thanks but on the other end of the spectrum another bit i really liked was uh when they're in the car and layla puts in i don't remember her name but i keep meaning to look her up the croatian pop star tai chi <laughs> Which sounds like that. I don't know what it is. Is it like a martial art? Like that? Yeah. Martial art, right? Yeah, yeah. I never know. It, feng Shui Tai Chi. I, I yeah, <laughs> I keep mixing those. Yeah, Tai Chi is uh, short for Tatiana. Oh. And uh, uh, she was quite big in late 80s and early 90s. And um, it's this, you know, sugar pop uh, in a way. Uh, it just seems like a bunch of producers found this very young uh, Croatian blonde and kind of turned her into this Yugoslav Marilyn Monroe figure. Um, and all of us listening to that as you know, little girls especially. And the, the, the craziest thing is that right before the war broke out, Tai Chi participated in the Eurovision Song Contest. Oh. Uh, with a song called for Yugoslavia, with a song called "Let's All Go Crazy," <laughs> and to me, you know, you have this this kind of Marilyn. You, I mean, everybody can look it up. It's on YouTube. There's this kind of Marilyn Monroe figure in a red dress, um, you know, jumping around and and singing "Let's All Go Crazy," and um, and then you know, for a country that is falling apart, and then the war breaks out so to me this was also a powerful you know symbol of you know yugoslav pop scene and everything um to to use in in the novel because i really thought about the music that i wanted to feature excellent yeah and i that i mean music has been such a huge part of my life and just i i felt that like the moment like when there's intention in the car and the song can just change things especially something that connects you to your youth like that yeah and it's also you know things that um that's the difference with your, between your old friends and your new friends. With your new friends, you can pretend to be this very cool person who listens to this very cool music, you know, this kind of obscure hipster alternative, whatever. But, you know, your old friends are going to call you out on these things and be like, I remember you dancing to, you know, Tai Chi on your 10th birthday. Uh, so this is that moment for Sarah where she's kind of, you know, um, has to face um, her own identity that she had left behind and be like, I'm also that person. And Layla is always there to kind of call her out in that. So what do you listen to? <laughs> I listen to so many different things. Like I wouldn't even know where to start. I think part of becoming an adult in a way is like, when you stop taking yourself too seriously and stop thinking that you only have to be one thing, yeah. which is kind of what we do as teenagers, you know, and, uh, and then try to fix everything into this one box. Um, so, you know, I mean, my Spotify is playlist is like everything from, you know, Megan B. Stallion to Shostakovich. <laughs> it's like, Excellent. It's, it's every, literally everything. There's a lot of really cheap Spanish reggaeton together with like the national, you know, so like sometimes I feel like, you know, the end of the year, Spotify tells you like, this is your year in, in music. And it's like, what is this? <laughs> Who is this person? And I just, I love that. And then there's also a lot of uh, bad uh, Balkan pop and <laughs> everything. Yeah, I'm proud of it. 
you should be. <laughs> I was going to ask about that, like uh, music and literature. I don't really know any Bosnian writers or uh, song performers. Um, but also the only, the only Serbian uh, writer I know is um, Basara. Am I saying that right? The Bicycle Conspiracy. Uh, Svetislav uh, Bas B -A -S ah, Basara. 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 Yeah. 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 So uh, all, you sorry. have you have you read that? That's a... I read like the first half of it, uh, um, okay. and I got another one which looked interesting, like Chinese letter that looked interesting. Yeah, that's one of his early early novels. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, I've have you ever been to Krakow? I've never been to Krakow. There's this amazing like half bookstore, half coffee shop there called Masalit, and in the back there's an English. Um, language translation section of all like the Slavic writers um, oh, that I, I never have found anywhere else. So I was in heaven. Um, I'm a huge fan of Bokov and um, yeah, the Russians. And, mm -hmm. and it was just like going in there um, and just like seeing, oh, I've, I've never heard of these. I just brought a bunch home and that one looked particularly interesting. Yeah, that's, that sounds great because I mean, I haven't really met a lot of Americans who have read um, Slavic literature or literatures um, in translation. There's a great publisher called the Dolky Archive Press. Or the Dolky oh, Press. yeah. And they actually do a great job. Uh, they're not my publisher, so I can do this. <laughs> uh, they do a great job translating and uh, publishing you know, less known Slavic writers, among others. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to check that bookshop uh, when I'm in Krakow, especially because it has it's called Masalit. Yes. <laughs> like the like the association in uh, the Master and Margarita. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's interesting. I have to go there. Yeah. I, I highly recommend it. And they had really good coffee and brownies too. <laughs> so it's like perfect. the perfect place. That's great. But Dolky Archive, um, yeah, they've been on my radar a lot. Did, do you know Yuzh Alishkovsky, Russian writer, did Kangaroo? No, unfortunately not. Oh, he was uh, like a Soviet dissident and he escaped to the US around 1980, I think. And he was a protest singer as well. And I read his novel Kangaroo, which was just brilliant um hilarious and i found out he lives like about an hour away from where i am right now and i really wanted to talk to him are you going to be that annoying reader who goes you know knocks well, no on one's writers? no one's ever written about him i thought you know he's written all this great stuff i would love to you know have the world be more aware and like uh he doesn't speak any english but i was in touch with his wife and it was just hysterical like it was just so russian she was just like well if we are live at the end of the year, uh, check back <laughs> then and maybe. And then at the end of the year, I check back and say like, no, this is not going to happen. And I just like, oh. Wow. Yeah. Well, you can still do some sort of you know, I should, like yeah. book club or talking about his books if you like them. Yeah. I, I mean, I loved it. the last book that I discovered uh, that was published by Dolky uh, Press was this um, Swiss Romanian writer. Um, a woman called Aglaya Veterani. I don't know if you've heard of it. I had never heard of her before that. Um, and she wrote this remarkable novel called Why the Child is Cooking in the Polenta, which, I mean, the, already the title is really strange. And, uh, and it's, it's a little masterpiece. Um, and then it turns out that she won all these big awards and um, unfortunately ended up committing suicide. So, and now it's kind of unknown. Uh, but uh, but a, a remarkable writer, and this is like one of those things that um, what they do at Dolky is that they can really discover somebody who's not really well known and deserves to be uh, read. Yeah. Maybe so, we can add this um, all these references or names if they're like a, uh, some sort of caption or something the podcast so that listeners can look them up. Yes, definitely. <laughs> You're gonna do that. It's you have to homework. email me. <laughs> yeah. The spelling. Sure. Yeah. So what are some of your other favorite books? Oh, that's a that's such a tough question. I mean, obviously, I studied English literature, so there's like a lot of English and American writers. Virginia Woolf was very influential, uh, and I still go back to some of her novels. Uh, we talk a lot about Joyce, 
but of course the Russians, um, that was my grandma's influence, uh, my communist grandma. <laughs> uh, so I had to read, you know, Tolstoy and Chekhov and Gogol and, and Bulgakov uh, at a very early age, the impressionable age. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mentioned the, the Master and Margarita, one of my all time favorite books. Um, yeah. And, um, and yeah, and I'm, kind of trying to read more of my contemporaries and especially like European writers that don't write in English so kind of trying to broaden my horizons one writer that I absolutely adore is a Norwegian writer Pierre Petersson um, it's written Peterson but apparently they pronounce it Petersson so I'm trying to <laughs> to, to do that so uh, he has these remarkable novels um, out, out stealing horses. And I can't remember who published it in English. I read him in English and the translations are brilliant. And another one is I Curse the River of Time. So I absolutely love his work. Um, definitely everybody should read him. And, uh, and another Hungarian that I discovered, unfortunately not a contemporary, but uh, a kind of a Hungarian classic that I didn't know about is Magda Sabo. Um, uh, and mm -hmm. I'm just, she, yeah, she has, I think she's published by Vintage. I might be mistaken, but we can look that up. Um, she has this remarkable novel called, uh, The Door and another one, which is Isa's Ballad or Isa's Ballad. I'm not sure what her new pronunciation is. And it's just a, a remarkable writer, like a, a real European classic that, uh, I should have known about before, but still have something to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. always good. How many languages do you read or speak? Uh, so I speak all together five, if you don't count my own native tongue, which has now become four languages <laughs> politically. <laughs> but I, I count it as one still. Um, so yeah, it was uh, English and Spanish was like my two uh, functional languages that I can read and, and speak and survive in. Um, I also learned Catalan while I was living in Barcelona, and it's a, it's a beautiful language. And then I get to actually read some of Catalan literature, which is also really exciting. Um, and, and then there's Italian, um, which was thanks to residencies and things. It's also easy. Uh, but I would really like to, to learn German. So now I'm actually studying German because um, I feel like romance languages are kind of taking over and I want to balance it out. <laughs> Good yeah yeah but seriously i think the best thing you can do is read in the original and then since you cannot really know all the languages what i try to do is read the books that are written in a germanic language so you know, region swedish or german i read them in english whereas if a book is written in french i would probably read it in catalan or spanish because that's closer to french and then if it's written in, in Russian or Polish, I would read it in my language because it's Slavic. So I think that's a good way, you know, getting closer to the original. In a way. I like that. And Nabokov translated all his own work, so you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, I'm not as talented as he was. Uh, and I don't have a loving wife helping me with all of that. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Nabokov and, and I... I and read almost almost all of his books i had this this one phase i think a lot of people go through another yep. Neville phase uh but yeah i'm a huge fan and i mean it's even more remarkable that he actually wrote in another language like another friend of mine um, alexander hamlin who you know writes in english and, and i really admire him and he does a great job i don't know if i could write directly in english probably could but i feel like it would be a different writer Mm. um but yeah i guess it's um that's something we should ask sasha <laughs> but it feels like you know. what's your favorite nabokov novel that's a great question uh i really love pale fire yeah. <laughs> i mean of course it used to be lolita uh but then um kind of then i had a, a panine phase i don't know if you read panine, panine is great is, i reread that like two years panine ago it's great i just wish people would you know be talking about it more um and but yeah pale i have to say pale fire is just uh, it's yeah it's a masterpiece i also love look at the harlequins um really yeah it's 
it's it's beautiful. I'll have to reread that. I just remember he was just sort of uh, lots of wordplay about his own life and work in there. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a what do you call it? Um, it's not exactly autobiographical, but um, a lot of his own um, life went into it, and it's just really poetic and beautiful and Nabokov. So can't go wrong with that. I think the gift is the most beautiful book I've ever read. That's just yeah, fantastic. yeah. Have so you read that? that one? That's your yeah. That's your favorite, Nabokov. Yeah, yeah. That and Pale Fire. Yeah. Um, oh, and what about Ada, 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 or Arder? That was all right. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a bit too much, right? Yeah. Um, Could be. And just the the um, the plot. I mean, there isn't much of a plot. <laughs> yeah. And but like stuff like. Uh, Invitation to Beheading, I think it's fantastic. Yes, yes. I love Invitation to Beheading. Yeah. It's great. Uh, but even like this, the smaller novels, if we can call them that, like King Queen Name and these, like I, I really enjoy it. I can always pick up uh, an Abakov and I know I'm going to have a good time. So, and yeah. learn a lot of new vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I come back to Glory a lot. I like that one. Yeah. Where, I haven't uh, read that in a very long time. Oh, and he's in you know, Switzerland. The, I mean, yeah, uh, but some of these books that you can remember the feelings you had while you were reading them, but not exactly what happens in the book. This happens to me a lot, but I, I've come to enjoy that and like that. You know, you see a book and it's like seeing an old friend and be like, oh, we had such a great time together. <laughs> Can't remember what we talked about, but I had such a great time with this person, you know? So sometimes it happens like that with certain books. I have to reread those. Yeah, definitely. I've said before that I wish there was a pill you could take to give you that feeling of reading the novel again without having to spend the hours doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. Then it's also interesting how books change over time because you have changed and then you get something completely different from it. Um, it's, yeah. To me, to me, it's remarkable. It's, there's this book that I really loved as a kid and it's the never ending story. Um, the, the German writer, Michal Ende. Um, I read it years before I, I, I saw the film because I'm Bosnian <laughs> and, uh, and it's just like that's a book that I would reread every five years or so and every five years or so it would be different and I would find something different and, and now as an adult I would you know sometimes I pick it up I have it actually by by my bed and uh, I would be like wow this is, this is so intelligent you know something that you can really see as a kid and then you can appreciate it as an adult but you know as a kid you just love the adventure it's nice how the book actually stayed the same but also kind of changed with me mm. I know that that well yeah <laughs> Tom Thomas Pynchon's novels are like that with me. Like I've reread a couple lately and it was very much different than when I remember. <laughs> yeah, which one is your favorite Pynchon? <laughs> Against the Day is probably my favorite book of all time. Um, okay. I love Gravity's Rainbow too. I've read it like four times, um, but Against the wow. Day is easier. And I think a lot more heartfelt, um, not as disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And you haven't done your um, snooping around and sneaking up and <laughs> finding Pynchon, etc., which you obviously like to <laughs> to do. One Russian, one obscure Russian author. <laughs> Come on, yeah. why, when is enough? <laughs> yeah. <Dang. laughs> um, but that would be interesting. Pynchon, that would be, I would listen to that podcast. Odd finding Pynchon. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, yeah, at the beginning we said we were going to talk about Barcelona. Um, is that where the book came to you? Yeah, I I actually um, I moved there. I was quite young. I was twenty five, and uh, and I had sort of that life of leaving everything behind, um, moving not just to another country but to a different language, living in a different language, working in a different language languages because I, I worked in English, but then I lived in Catalan or Spanish. Uh, Not making and, it easy for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and then I was, yeah, I wanted to write a book about my country, about certain things that were going on there in the 90s. Uh, and obviously I could put a lot of this feeling into the book from my own experience, which is what it's like to leave 
and and to be you know going back to your own language so that's where the book was was written and um i was very happy that one of the first translation deals that i got was catalan uh because i just felt um the book will go you know home in a way even though there's no barcelona whatsoever in the novel somehow to me that book belongs there how was it writing it being at a distance from what it's about and where you grew up i think it was a necessary distance because um i felt at some point because i i just decided you know deliberately to to leave i knew that i would leave i, I at the point uh, at that time, when I had made the decision, I didn't know where I would go, what I would do, but I was like, I have to leave. I cannot stay here um, in Bosnia. Um, I just felt like was, I couldn't get a job, uh, not even with a, an MA degree, um, or the job that I could get uh, would be I don't know, waiting tables or uh. like that being a secretary. Um, so um, I felt like if I stay here, I'm just gonna become this bitter old woman who just hates everything, um, and I think that's not good for a writer. It's not good for anyone. Anyone, but especially no. if you're writing, you know, it's not good to write from that place uh, of bitterness. Uh, and and so I I thought like I have to I, I have to leave, um, and then that that distance kind of gave me um, some sort of you know different different kind of emotions and the way I was looking at things and you know um like thinking things that I experienced there um it changed and then there was more warmth and um so I think I think distance is important for a writer but it's a tricky thing because you have to be inside and at the same time kind of be outside looking at it at the experience so um for me, it was the best way to do it. And um, I mean, just like, you know, Joyce left Ireland and then spent the rest of his years writing about Ireland <laughs> um, uh, without the internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Um, but I think that this distance is, is necessary. And to me, it was definitely helpful. Have you, you, you mentioned you were in Italy a few times. Were you in uh did you follow Joyce Joyce's path around? Were you in Trieste? Of course. <laughs> I can't believe you're even asking that. I have a friend, my poor friend, who had to go around Trieste recording me explaining things <laughs> to a non-existing audience <laughs> that doesn't care about Joyce. Uh, but I kind of did my own video of like, here we are. This is, you know, Via Donato Bramante. This is where Joy started writing chapters, blah, blah, blah. So I had the, the whole Trieste tour with her and she was really nice. I mean, friends are really special people. We should really be better to them. <laughs> the things they would do for us. Um, is this on so, YouTube? Yeah. No, luckily it isn't. <laughs> It, it's on my Instagram, but I've now I'm kind of on a digital detox, so I've de deactivated everything. But when I come back, it will be there. It's the Joyce Trieste tour. Yeah. And I've also done a similar thing in Zurich, but with the lovely Fritz Zen, the director that I mentioned, who's 93 and who agreed to take me on a Joyce tour in Zurich. So I felt very, very privileged. This sounds fantastic. You should do a TV program. <laughs> yeah. I would have three viewers. One of them would hey, be, be you. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell Thomas Pinch and, and you Jelaskowski <laughs> when they're on the podcast that they have to watch. Perfect. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to get rich. <laughs> tell me about the digital detox. I just decided today to get off Facebook and it feels fantastic. Oh, that's the best decision ever. Uh, I got off Facebook three years ago. And, um, you know, I wasn't, I mean, at that point, it's not like I was any, anywhere near where I am now. So I was, you know, there's always this fear. No, I'm, you know, an aspiring writer. I should be, you know, using these tools, blah, blah, blah. But actually, at the end of the day, you're just lying to yourself. You're not using them you know, professionally, you were just scrolling through an endless pile of nothing, uh, trying to quench a sort of thirst that we have for interaction, and then it's never real interaction. So to me, getting off Facebook was like the best thing ever. There's a lot of toxic people there. I felt like 
it was not real communication and i was just at the end of the day i was just getting angry there's this great meme i don't know if you've seen it there's like there's this guy says honey i can't come to bed because somebody on the internet is wrong <laughs> i was that person i was the person that had uh -huh. to correct every <laughs> you know I don't want to um, say bad words, but <laughs> every toxic person on Facebook. So, so yeah, I did that. And that was like the best decision ever. It had zero impact on my career or whatever you want to call it, because, you know, everything kind of kicked off and, and like I got all these translation deals and I actually managed to use the internet uh, professionally in different ways. So I didn't really lose anything by, by getting off Facebook. Um, I've never had Twitter. Uh, there are a lot of angry men on Twitter that I don't want to deal with. I cannot do that work. I know there, there are some people doing, you know, God's work there <laughs> on Twitter, but I cannot be that person. Uh, but I did got, uh, did get really hooked on Instagram. Um, and uh, so I recently I decided I'm going to deactivate it temporarily. And then once I feel I'm clean, I can go back and just use it for, because there's, there's an actual um, community of readers there. So that's where I feel Instagram is much more useful for me. Uh, but still, I needed a detox. And I got to tell you, it feels great. I mean, I've reconnected with people. I actually have to talk to them. I actually have to, you know, uh, make that effort of calling a friend or, or texting a friend, going somewhere, doing something. Uh, so I really encourage everybody listening to this to, to try it out at least for, for a while. Yeah. Excellent. I'm glad uh, I have your support. <laughs> Because, yeah, I was, I was just like, oh, I could stay on and people might see my videos. Like, no, people aren't seeing the videos. Nobody cares. It's just a, and like in the three years since you've been on, it's just ads now. And you see exactly. like the same three people all the time. Yeah. Like, and, you know, it's just this feeling of which is completely false that you feel like you open you know, Facebook or Instagram and you feel like you're out there in the world, but it's actually just a tiny bubble. <laughs> yeah. Like you're, you're not out there. You're not speaking to the world. You're just, you know, talking to people who already think the way you think, seeing these products. You're, you're just somewhere in, in some marketing agency in some list as a type of, you know, for something. Uh, and I just felt like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So yeah, people, you can do it. The struggle is real, but you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not that hard to just text somebody and say, you want to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> just try it out. So are you going back to Zurich? Are you? No, uh, my Zurich that? era is done. Uh, I could never. Uh, so Paris to... next, I guess, is where Joyce <laughs> went. <laughs> no, no, now I have a couple of, I mean, I go where, you know, these residencies take me, you know, I'm, I'm living that sort of life, you know, in a suitcase, um, and uh, it feels great. Uh, so I'm going to Timisoara next in Romania. Uh, I've been invited there for a month residency, and then I go to Germany, hopefully can learn some German. Um, and I've applied for a couple more residencies next year. So, yeah, I mean, I just love traveling. I love actually living somewhere else for a while and trying to learn language and, and get to know sort of local literary scene. Um, so, yeah, if, if you ask me where, where I'll be next year, I can't really tell you. <laughs> uh, and I like that. Sometimes we should embrace the not knowing. Where are you going in Germany? Um, I will be in uh, Bremen, which is close okay. to Hamburg. Yeah. yeah, I will be there for a month. Uh, but I've also applied for Berlin, which um, I would really love to visit. So that's probably going to be next year if Excellent. I get it. Yeah. Um, speaking of the local literary scenes, this have you done any readings or anything with Catch the Rabbit? Like, I at least the English version, there hasn't been a chance, right? No, I mean, uh, I had that bad luck, as many people have, the, to, to, to have my book published during this pandemic. And um, especially the translations came out during the pandemic. So I couldn't really do any actual you know, tours, reading, whatever. Uh, and that was really sad because that was my 
chance to cross the ocean. I've never been. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to, right. I've never been to another continent, which for me is terrible. But you know, it's um, uh, it's some, somehow that's what happened. Um, and this was my chance, and it couldn't happen, and I was very sad. But I got to do a lot of zooms uh, <laughs> and a lot of uh, online readings. And now things are slowly starting to get better. So I'm looking forward to actually visiting um, the States and, and, and um, other continents as well <laughs> that I haven't been to finally. So you, you like that sort of traveling and performing lifestyle? Not the performing part, but the truth is if I can get a free ticket to somewhere, <laughs> I have to, I mean, I'm a writer. I'm not exactly <laughs> somebody who can go, you know, around buying all these uh, flight tickets and stuff. So this is a perfect chance for me to, to you know, uh, travel abroad and, 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 and meet all these other people. But I also like, I have to admit, I like meeting readers, um, especially um, when it's sort of a book club thing. So it's not exactly you know, a book talk where people are just getting introduced to the book and know nothing about it and you're supposed to sell it. I prefer talking to people who have read it. Mm. Uh, so instead yeah. of kind of persuading them to buy it, which it I'm seems more meaningful comfortable with. Yeah, this way, like they can actually give me feedback, ask me questions, and I can kind of get an idea of how different readership, you know, responds to the book because there's like the, an American is going to read it differently, you know, than I know, say Italian readers, etc. So this is actually quite educational for me too. So I like that. I was going to ask: Was uh, Vienna always the end destination you had in mind? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I had, um, as I said, I'm not as talented as Nabokov. I'm not a genius, <laughs> so I really have to plan and work. Um, and I had a, a very, you know, clear. Uh, well thought plan of, of the where these women would go and which places they would go through and that they, they would end up in Vienna for many different reasons. One of them being um, the painting of Albrecht Dürer, which is in Vienna, in, in a museum in Vienna. And I, this painting was very important for me. And so they had to go there. But also because I was talking about Bosnia and it is the book about Bosnia, um, Austro, the Austro-Hungarian occupation of Bosnia was important to me mm. um, to, to also kind of tackle in a way. Um, so this is why there's a character, uh, an Austrian guy who actually has the same name as the Austro-Hungarian emperor. And then, you know, it, it was important for me to have him there and do what he does. Um, and um, and also because Vienna is the closest, uh, you know, big European capital to the Balkans. It's kind of the, the you know, the gateway to Europe for a lot of people uh, from the Balkans. And still this kind of dream that people have of, you know, going there and making it there, you know, getting a job, earning a lot of money, buying a good car, and then going back home in that great car so that everybody could see you. Like there's still, if you walk, um uh, around in vienna on any given day you're definitely going to hear my my native tongue somewhere in the street like it happened to me like a lot of immigrants oh. in vienna so for many different reasons it made sense that they would end up there and then i could also use it to to say something about the history of, of my country um you saying about the character's name the emperor uh, have you read uh, the good soldier spake Yes, the good soldier streak. <laughs> I love that book. <laughs> it's it's amazing. I love it. It's great. Yeah, uh, we should do another podcast just talking about that, other books. <laughs> I hope we've covered yeah. your book enough. I know we've detoured it. <laughs> more than enough. <laughs> okay. More than enough. I, I have to say, I prefer these kind of um, talks and conversations because I feel like I can also participate as a reader, uh, which I think is to me more important than um, being a writer. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's great. What are you reading now? Now I'm reading, I'm actually, I mentioned the Norwegian writer, Pierre, Pierre Petersen, <laughs> because uh, I'm reading this novel that has recently been translated here and it's called uh, Men in My Situation. And um, 
I, I really like it. I just love everything. It's one of these writers that like never lets me down. And, and it's just, I'm happy because with this book, he's kind of taking a different turn because uh, his earlier novels, they kind of revolved around the same family and were very similar in a way. And this is something very different and it's great. So um, I'm really enjoying it and I can recommend it to everyone. Men in my situation. Men in my situation, cool. And do you have any short stories come like on the horizon? Anything else coming out? Well, um, this this book that I uh, that um, it came out last year, I think, and it's just with, with COVID, I feel like everything is one long year, like <laughs> no longer, you know, <laughs> 2020, 2021, like it's all kind of mixed up. Um, yeah, it came out last year, and um, I'm happy because some of the stories from that collection will be published in English in different magazines. Um, so that's really exciting because it's, I mean, English is always exciting uh, uh, to be publishing because it's not that easy. Um, but I also got some, some translation deals for the whole book. So, um, so I'm happy about that. However, I have to finish this novel because I have a contract. Oh, all right. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I feel like maybe that's the problem because my first novel, there was no contract, no agent, no publisher, nobody. I thought my friends would read it and that was it. So I feel like it was easier for me to, to finish that book yeah, than no this pressure. one. Because now I'm seriously struggling with imposter syndrome big oh. time. And it's a real thing. And um, to all of my fellow writers out there, like I, I hear you and it's tough. And sometimes at the end of the day, I have to switch all of these, this noise off, like not think about contract, publisher, translation, blah, 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 critics, whatever. And just go back to that, you know, happy place <laughs> where I can just write. Um, and it's, it's, a struggle but um but it's also a learning process so that's good do you write every day i try to but i don't i definitely don't oh. so yeah uh, i should but uh there are also many other things that um that i have to do now that all these translations are out um and it's hard because i still haven't learned how to talk about one book and write a different book you know because i'm still like talking a lot of other rabbit in these different things and in different languages but um I, I then I need to get out of that and get into this you know different mindset when I'm writing this other book because to me I don't know how other writers do it but for me when I was writing the, the first novel I had to become completely obsessed with it it's like almost nothing else exists I have to get inside it and you know if I cut that like if I'm out, it's really hard to get back in. So now mm -hmm. I have the same problem, but now it's much harder to get inside that, you know, um, book in a way because the previous one keeps um, pulling me back, but um, I'm learning, so yeah. I feel it's that way with everything. You kind of have to be completely focused or things just don't get done. There are just so many distractions. Probably, yeah. I, I'm also like that. I mean, I know a lot of people who can multitask and do many things at once. And, yeah. you know, in the morning, talk about one thing. But to me, it's like when it comes to writing a novel, it's like I have to go all in. Otherwise, it's just somehow not working. Do you have a preferred time of day to write? I always write at night. Really? <laughs> Yeah, it's not the, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm, I'm a night owl, 100%. I feel like I'm the most creative at night. All of my good ideas come to me at night. And um, I'm not that person that's going to get up at six and go jogging and then have coffee. That's not going to happen. It took me 35 years to accept that I'm just not that person, that I love to sleep in and I'm the happiest when I can sleep in. Um, so yeah, but that also means that, you know, sometimes I would stay up, you know, till 3 or 4 a.m. writing, which is not the best thing to do. Luckily, I don't have a, a day job, so, <laughs> so you know, I can sleep um, in the morning. But I think, you know, when you start, you know, writing and you want to get out there and then you look for all this advice from you know other writers telling you how to do it everybody 
says something different. Completely different, yeah. <laughs> Completely different. And I, I think you just have to find your thing, your time, your place, you know, and just stick to it and not think about being the writer. Um, Cause I think that can be intimidating, but just think about little steps, like just not writing a novel, but like writing this dialogue, writing the scene, writing this little description. I think to me, uh, when I kind of break it down to these little steps, then I can, then I can work. But if you think I'm a writer and this is my second novel and it's kind of intimidating, I think it's gonna, I don't think it's a good place um, to write from. So I'm going to be another pretentious writer giving advice, but <laughs> that's actually really good advice thing. though. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the journey just, of thousand miles begins with the first step just yeah yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. but seriously but, like uh don't you know just find your thing somebody somebody likes writing in the morning somebody likes writing at night the middle of the night whatever on your phone you know it doesn't have to be longhand in a beautiful notebook like do you write longhand works. um it's, it you know i like to start like when i have an idea and then i want to like see what how I would open the novel, um, what I would open it with, then I like to like write it longhand. But as soon as I get it, uh, I, I move to, to my computer because it's just like, why would I? <laughs> yeah, it has to be done sometime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, whatever works. I mean, sometimes I would really, I would be on a bus or a tram and I would think of something and I would take my phone and actually some, some passages from my phone made their way into the final cut <laughs> and the final draft of the novel uh, and they work. So, you know, whatever, whatever works, whenever it comes to you, just, just write it. I think the, the important thing is not to wait for the perfect moment. Yeah. You know, this, this thing comes. of, yeah, I'm going to wait for that perfect you know place and perfect time and and then it's, it's never going to be there like start like the worst moment possible you know when you're like you're back from the grocery store and you're unpacking you're like okay i'm gonna sit in like, like it doesn't matter just you know you have to kind of trick yourself into it like anna you're just gonna open the document and look at it you're not gonna write <laughs> you know and then and then you can get because if you wait for the perfect moment it's not gonna happen the Nabokov system of writing on note cards has always yeah. just seemed insane to me. <laughs> it's insane. There's index cards. I've tried it. You know, I had that phase, the Nabokov phase. And um, it's interesting how it kind of shapes the way we think about scenes and things because it's, it's, you know, it's such a little space to work on. And then like, you can see why he thought about every word and thesaurus and genius and that, but writing a, a whole novel on that, I mean, that's, that's just insane. Yeah. I have, I still have some index cards, but I use them for like ideas, you know, yeah. just jot, jot things down, but there's no way I could ever write on that. But there's one great thing that I discovered. Um, I'm not going to give at the brand name because then it feels like, they're sponsoring or something like yeah. that. But there, there are these distraction-free devices that you can look up, like distraction-free writing, where you just get, like there are many different brands, but basically what you have is a keyboard and this nothing else. And this keyboard has a tiny little display <laughs> that it can like fit, I don't know, three sentences or like you know, four lines in that sentence, but like, let's say like three or four lines. Um, and that's the only thing it can do. So it's, it's really great for working in your first draft. I mean, you just want to get out, get it all out, you know, mm. uh, cause you just have to keep going. You cannot really look back too much, you know, there are only three or four lines and then you can, um, uh, export that to your computer and then you have a draft and then you can work on it, but it's really, really great. And especially, I mean, it's hard for us writing these so-called small languages because there are a lot of keyboards that don't support these crazy oh, right. yeah. uh, letters. <laughs> but if you write in English, really, there's no excuse. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of, especially for, for English writers, a lot of great uh, distraction-free devices. And, and I would recommend this. I, I think this is uh, 
this is because nowadays we use the same thing for you know email um i don't know social networks watching a movie writing <laughs> yeah and then it's it all gets mixed up so when you sit down and look at your computer you don't associate it with writing only you know it's so mm. many different things and i think it's it's or maybe uh, i don't know why this is turning into you know tips <laughs> Tips with it's Lana, I'm it's sorry. The, uh, tips with Lana section of the podcast. <laughs> I just I just feel like I wish somebody had told me these things, but like get like get a crappy computer. Can I say crappy? Is that okay? Yeah, you can swear um, if you want. Yeah. So get like a shitty are there computer. Any good, are there any good uh Serbian curse words? Of course I can teach you a, a whole bunch. Um, but um reading Shvake really taught me a lot of good Slavic yeah. curses. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you're, we're on true. tips with Lana. I don't want to distract us. <laughs> yeah, and also in Bulgakov, I just love in the Master Margarita. Like, I think the word devil is repeated like a hundred times or something. Um, no, just this is my last tip <laughs> that you that nobody asked for. Here it goes. Um, yeah, get a shitty computer that cannot even, you know, you cannot even connect it to the internet and just use it for writing. I think that's a great tip like just yeah just, that's going to be so when you open it you know this is just for writing and uh, so i think these things work let's see i still have to finish my second novel <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it's true then <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> give me a good bosnian curse word oh god they're really bad all right <laughs> it's just like i i can't even like yeah i can't do it Right. They're like really bad, but it's really strange because, you know, um, in Bosnia, well, Serbia and Croatian, most of the curse words have to do with intercourse. Yes. With copulation. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in Spanish, it's all about shit and taking crap. It's so interesting. You know, it's a, it's like a crap oriented <laughs> culture <laughs> yeah like very scatological so everything is like i, sh I sh you know spaniards would say i shit on your mother and things like this whereas in serbia Bosnia, etc it would have to be i fuck your mother we are we like to talk about mothers <laughs> so it's like it's like the the holy thing you know uh but it's interesting how different cultures find different things profane i think yeah. the big one i took out of shveik was and i'll probably butcher this but it's a Yebum te dushku, fuck your soul. Yeah, which was just like that's like the most intense <laughs> thing you can. Yeah, with. <laughs> yeah. With, with us, it would be yebum te mater, which is like I fuck your mother. Oh. Yeah. You were gonna hear it like everything with yeb, all the different <laughs> varieties. And then you know there are things like when you translate them, it doesn't really make any sense. But like there are things that we say to little kids. Um, when, for example, a, a child is playing with a toy and the toy breaks, and then you want to comfort the child. <laughs> and then you would, you know, be like, you would say, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But we say this sentence, which is, misha, which is, I fuck a mouse. <laughs> I don't know you why say that we to say a child. That. We say that to children. <laughs> I don't know why, but you're like you want to say, "Oh fuck," you know, but like not a person, but a mouse. That's like better. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's terrible. It's not until you translate something that you realize how terrible it is. I remember um, speaking of animals. I once had a Macedonian roommate. And we were talking about the Cyrillic alphabet because I tried to learn Russian once because my grandmother was Russian. And uh, the, the, the Java, the one that looks like a frog, the yeah. letter. Uh, what is it? Z. Z. Yeah. I mixed that up and I was like, oh yeah, the Yabum. And the look on <laughs> this woman's face was just one of complete horror. And she was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. That, that means fuck. And I was just like, oh. yeah. I'm yeah sorry. yeah that's really funny between languages i was i remember in barcelona i was walking down with my with my ex and i saw this the cutest little spanish lady that you can imagine you know like from a pixar movie and i just said in my own language i, I said like oh a little old lady and i said malabaca which means the, the like little grandma and in spanish malabaca means an evil cow <laughs> 
So basically, I call like the, the sweetest little grandma in the world, I call her an evil cow. So it's like these things. But to me, it's like, it's also very juicy and, you know, looking yeah. for these. Things. That's wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, don't do that. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You have anything else you want to add? Uh, no more tips. No more tips. <laughs> from me. No. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this. And um, I'll make sure to email you some, or maybe like here in the message box, write down some names that we mentioned. Yes. Yes. That would be super helpful to spread the word of obscure European literature. Great. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks, Lana.